this December is the first time in all my ministry, and I I preached my first message when I was 15, so that's a long time ago, and that's a lot of years of doing this, and a lot of years of pastoring and all that, but none of that time have I ever spent an entire December talking about the Christmas story. I spent every Sunday, every Wednesday this month, and I don't know about you, um, I've gotten to the point where I'm, I'm preaching more for me than I am for you, hallelujah, because uh, there was a time in my ministry when I used to study to get a message, now I study to feed myself, and there's a huge, huge difference, and then you can begin to teach and preach out of the overflow of what you're receiving, and it's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge difference. And so, there's been some things this December, I just really focused on the story. I hope you've been blessed this month, but if not, I've been blessed, and I, I just kind of have uncovered some things over the past month, and things maybe that I never had really looked at the, that particular way. And here we are, uh, it's the Wednesday after Christmas, and I'm sure you thought I was done with Christmas. Uh, but I want to take your attention to Matthew chapter 2, and there's a reason for this. Matthew chapter 2, and I want to I spend one more night uh, wrapped around the story. How many of you understand this, though, that really the Christmas season goes all the way until the 6th of January? So I, I could eke another two or so out of this but I'll uh, I'll finish up here tonight because starting Sunday uh, the first Sunday of the new year please remember this one service only here Sunday 10 a.m. just one service everybody together as we start the new year and uh, we're going into 2017 with this in mind we're going to reset refocus and reposition we're going to reset, refocus, and reposition and believe that God is going to do tremendous things for us here at the refuge. So you don't have to worry about Christmas this coming Sunday, but be here at 10 o'clock. But Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, After the wise men were gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. and Get up and flee to Egypt with a child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return. Because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And that night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary his mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death. And this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet when he said, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him, sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah when he said a cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted for they are dead. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. He said, get up, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. And then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And this fulfilled what the prophets had said, that he will be called a Nazarene. Now then, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture there. And then I'm going to get into this and get out of your way here tonight but Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 10 again New Living Translation says this God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory and it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering a perfect leader now listen there is an entire message there that I don't have time to deal with tonight but Jesus was made a perfect leader through his suffering. For all of you that don't ever want to go through anything, 
there's no future for you. Because you're only made into what you can be through suffering. To make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. He also said, I will put trust, my trust in him. That is, I and the children God has given me. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself had gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Amen? I read a story recently, and I'm just going to title this tonight, The Aftermath of Christmas. The aftermath of Christmas. But, but I read a story recently about two college kids who were hanging out together over the Christmas holidays. And on one of their lonely night conversations, they began to talk about the story of Christmas. And that story caused them to get further into the whole narrative of Christianity and their faith. <laughs> and one of their... One of the boys was the son of an Episcopal priest. And that particular boy had spent most of his life running from what his father preached and teached and lived out. He, he spent his, his life trying to distance himself from anything that had to do with what he considered his father's faith. And as the discussion was winding down and they were beginning to get ready to move to another topic, the young man said something, the one whose father was an Episcopal priest, said something to his friend that I believe is true for a lot of people today. And he said this, he said, I'll admit this to you. Christmas is good stuff. This special baby being born who's going to make things better and people coming together to celebrate and peace on earth and goodwill to all. I can get behind all of that. But then he smiled and he leaned forward and he said in almost a whisper to his friend, he said, but once that baby starts growing, that's where I start having problems. I believe that that is true for a lot of people in and around Christianity today. Everybody's on board with Christmas and peace and goodwill and Let's be nice and all those other kind of things. But it doesn't take long for that spirit to pass. In fact, it passed for somebody today. I just sent out a, just a little, on our text thing, I just sent out a little nice message. Hey, just, it's been a week since we've had church. Just want to remind everybody, uh, tonight's the, you know, come on back tonight. I didn't think I said anything offensive. I, uh, many of you got the message. I, I didn't think I said anything offensive. And, and I got a message back. And it started out with uh, the letter F and, and another letter and a few more letters. And, and, then, and then told me to take my God. And I knew what I could do with my God. And, and man, just went into this tirade. And I'm connected to this server where all the messages we get go to this service <laughs> that provides this text thing for us. And I'm thinking, oh, man, how do I delete that before they see that and give me a call and wonder? <laughs> and uh, and, and, and uh, I was trying to be really nice and because I, I, it's got a deal in there where you can. We're not supposed to get into a lot of conversation with people, but. 
you can have a conversation. And I, I got in there a little bit, and I, I just I just apologized and said, hey, didn't mean to offend you. We'll, we'll take you off our list. And, man, then, then it came back, and it was, even, it was even worse. I got called a few names I hadn't heard in a few years. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, man, isn't that crazy? Just a few days ago, everybody's hugging and smiling and peace on earth and goodwill to all men. And just a few days later, the spirit of Antichrist is still alive and well. Amen? Because nobody is really offended by the baby Jesus. But when, when the baby begins to grow into his role as a king, that's when we begin to have problems. And I think that that young man was on to something because if you... If you stop the story of Christmas with the visit of the Magi and the wise men from the east, what you've got is a beautiful story of love and peace and hope. And it's a story that greeting cards are made out of. And all those different images of shepherds on the hillsides and they're gazing at the stars and they're, they're doing all that great thing. And here come the wise men on their camels and they're bringing gifts and they're laying it before the cutest little baby you've ever seen. And, and then you go to, go to pageants and you go to church Christmas programs and you have, you have little kids playing Mary and Joseph and you've got them dropping the baby Jesus and everybody's laughing and everybody's all in the mood and all in the spirit. And if you, if you stopped right there, then it it would be just a, a, a wonderful, feel-good story. But the truth of the matter is, the story doesn't end there. Because most of, most of what we know about Christmas stopped in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. We don't ever start with 13 and begin to read the rest of the story. Because the story didn't end with the wise men coming and bringing their gifts. The story doesn't end there. What followed doesn't get put on greeting cards. What, what followed after that doesn't get acted out in the church Christmas play. But what followed after that was Joseph being jolted out of a dead sleep and sitting upright and being awakened from a dream and reaching over and shaking Mary and telling Mary, Hey, I've gotten a word from the angel and listen. You're going to listen to an angel that has already come one time and told you, hey, your girlfriend's pregnant and it ain't yours. So Joseph wasn't having any problem listening to an angel. And an angel comes to him in a dream and tells him, you've got to get out here. <coughs> you've got to get out of here. And, you, <coughs> and you've, you've got to, we've got to get going and we've got to pack everything that we own. Every possession that we own, we've got to cram into these sacks and, and, and we've got to listen for troops because an angel has warned me that they're coming to kill the child. <coughs> now, I want to preach, but uh, I'm having some health issues, so y'all just might have to listen while I stutter around for a minute. And they wanted to, uh, they wanted the story to end there, but that's not where it ended. And you can feel the panic now as Mary's bent over the baby, desperately trying to keep him quiet as Joseph leads the donkey that's holding Mary and the baby out of the city. And both Mary and Joseph are looking over their shoulder. And not long after them, here come if you were to be in Bethlehem at that time, you would have been in there. And what you would have seen would have been soldiers coming with, with, with torches and swords and spears. And they were kicking doors open in Bethlehem. And they were taking every male child under the age of two years old. And they were indiscriminately killing and destroying every male child under two years old. That's what happened in the rest of the story. Taking babies from their screaming mother's arms. This is a part we don't like to talk about. Not everybody appreciates the Christmas story. But see, not, not everybody responds to it the same way. 
Not everybody responds to the hopes and the promises that come with the Christmas story with joy. If you, if you were to go back and, and look at how Herod responded to the, you know, we were in here Christmas Eve night and it was beautiful and candlelight and we were singing Silent Night and we were singing Go Tell It on the Mountain and Oh Holy Night and man, it was, you could feel the love of God in this room and people were with their families and, and it was wonderful to be in here and it was wonderful to be in that presence. But if, if we could have just kind of gone back to the night that Jesus was actually born i'm telling you while shepherds were were trembling in 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 faithful fear of of what it was being told to them and while wise men were making a trek and while joseph and mary were were in awe of what had just happened herod wasn't near as excited about what was going on herod in a very snake in the grass kind of way knows here why listen to me why Why would Herod (coughs) say that every child under two needed to be destroyed? Go back with me for just a minute. It wasn't all the scholars. When the wise men came asking for directions to Bethlehem, it wasn't the scholars, the Bible scholars. It wasn't the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, or any of the rest of them, the Zealots. It wasn't any of those guys who were alert enough to wonder, hey, why are wise men coming and asking for the direction to Bethlehem? None of those guys were alert enough to even be paying attention that these guys are asking directions to go see a baby born in Bethlehem, and we've been given promises that a baby was going to be born in Bethlehem. Do you know until Jesus was born, Herod had made himself and given himself the title King of the Jews? He'd given himself the title King of the Jews, and it was Herod who took notice when the wise men asked for directions to Bethlehem. And after they left, it was Herod who said, hey, we got to do something because I know who they're going to see. See, Herod, while many others didn't believe it, Herod believed it, but he believed it for all the wrong reasons. And what Herod believed was that if he allowed this baby to continue to grow, this baby was a threat to his personal kingdom. I'm trying to go somewhere. Are you still with me? He was a threat to Herod's personal kingdom, and and Herod knew that if this baby starts to grow up, I'm going to have real problems. And Herod knows that there are very effective ways for solving problems before they start. Herod was very skilled at royal politics. He was skilled at all of that. And so he put the order out, because if this baby grows, I'm going to have a problem on my hand. I'm going to have a problem in our world if this baby, because I know what just happened in Bethlehem. And so he goes and has all these children, or gives the order to have all these children killed. And a lot of us can even go comfortably that far into the story. I mean, because he tells the wise men, you know, he once he figures out that they have... uh, gotten the skinny on him, so to speak, He told them, come back and tell me where you found him. Remember that part, Hal? Come back and tell me where you found him. And and men, they listened to the angel too because the angel told them, hey, Herod's out to kill the baby. Go home a different way than you came. And the wise men listened to the voice of God and went home a different way. And Herod realized that they had, they had circumvented his efforts to, to get information. And, and they went home a different way. And a lot of us, you know, we could stop the story even right there because, oh, look at there. The, the wise men didn't, didn't bow to political pressure. They, they went home a different way. They got wise to what Herod was doing. They, they, they went a different route to home. That'd be a great ending to the story there. The wicked king sitting in his palace waiting to kill the Christ child and finally realizing too late that he's been duped and won't be able to find Jesus. The wise men gets away. Jesus gets away. Everybody's okay. Let's close the book. That's the end of the story. But that isn't what happens. Because the story keeps going. And since he can't eliminate the actual threat, Jesus, he takes the next step and he eliminates all the potential threats and he slaughters every male child in and around Bethlehem under the age of two years old. For Herod, I'm going somewhere, just stay with me. But for Herod, it's an obvious choice. He's been challenged. He's been made to look like a fool by those wise men. He has to show the Judeans who he rules over who's still in charge. 
He has to keep his grip on the throne strong. And so for Herod, Herod doesn't even view it really as an atrocity against children. Herod just views it as a political move. It's just politically expedient for him to do what he needs to do. I mean, after all, for Herod, he's a king, and this is how kingdoms operate, and this is just business as usual. It's how the world works. And yet, it's an ugly, ugly, ugly story. And there's a lot of people that want to take it out of the Christmas story. You hardly ever hear this really talked about around Christmas time. In fact, there are no Christmas carols written about this part of the story. Designers and, 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 and programmers and producers never work this into their pageants and, or onto their greeting cards. In fact, early century in the church, it was taken out of most Christmas service readings. They, they would not even allow it to be read in most Protestant churches. Because much like the church today, we still don't want to deal with the ugly side of things. We're comfortable with cosmetic Christianity. And, and why do we need to bring such a dark note into the beauty of Christmas? Do we really need to remember that that was part of the story? And in fact, if you really search the Bible out, Matthew, again, is the only gospel writer who even brings it up. But even he kind of treads carefully and softly and, and walks softly around it. And, and he points out that, that what really Herod did was fulfill Jeremiah's prophecy. And he tries to use that to say, you know, this had to be part of, of the plan because it was part of the a prophecy being fulfilled. But I'm going to tell you what, whether it was part of prophecy being fulfilled or not, it's an ugly part of the story. Amen? I wonder, think, think with me for just a minute. I'm closer to done than you know. But think with me for just a minute. Come present world with me just a minute. Come into the here and now. And I wonder how often. Just imagine for a moment. Just imagine for a moment the weeping and the wailing that was going on in Bethlehem that night. Imagine. All right, now let's come into present day. And let me ask you this question. I wonder how often we have heard those same kind of inconsolable cries rising up in the world that we live in. You don't have to look very far in history to realize that the same kind of thing that happened in Bethlehem happened in mine and your lifetime in Rwanda, in Turkey. It's happening right now in a place called Aleppo. Oh, it's quiet now, right? And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And whether we want to acknowledge it or recognize it or not, the truth is there was a reason why. This is where I'm going tonight. Stay with me. There was a reason why the prophets talked about the ushering in of a new style of government with the coming of the Messiah. There was a reason. Because every other kingdom and government on earth that is man-initiated is established through force and domination. And it's through force and domination of other people that established authorities acquire and preserve power and authority for themselves. And the more that they assert themselves through fighting and domination and warfare, the more they ensure that the injustice and the hatred and the death continue to be the axis on which the world turns. And the, and the, the, the prophets of old said, but hold on a minute. There is one who is coming who shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting. 
everlasting father and the prince of peace and you and the government shall be upon his shoulders because he's bringing a new way of doing things because how many of you understand that from the beginning of time those in power have always been opposed to the coming of Jesus and they're still opposed to the coming of Jesus in the world that we live in today the reason that so many people still fight about Jesus coming into their heart and life is because many of us are little Herods we don't want to give up control of our own kingdom and I don't have a problem with baby Jesus but when that baby begins to grow we're going to have some problems there are people that come to this church week in and week out Yeehaw. everybody's happy tonight Listen, there are people who come here week in and week out who are resistant to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't appear to be resistant on the outside, but inwardly they are resistant to the message because, listen, the coming of Jesus was an incarnation. It was God being embodied into a filthy world. And God not coming to say, I'm taking sides. God coming to say, I'm taking over. God coming to say, I'm establishing a new thing. God saying, I'm creating something brand new. It was God saying, hey, you guys haven't been able to do it. I'm coming to show you a new way. It's the same way in my heart and in your heart. Jesus coming in is an incarnation of God coming into you and coming into me. But I have to let him rule in me if I want his ways. Too many of us don't want to let him rule. I want to rule. I want things done my way. I want to live for God on my terms. I want things to go on my terms. I say I trust God, but I keep trying to tell him how to handle his business. Come on, somebody. Preaching better than you're acting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Am I I helping anybody? Probably not, but I'm helping me. Hallelujah. I think think way too many of us who profess to be Christians live way too deep in our emotions and feelings when it comes to the practice of our faith. Someone has convinced us that if we're Christians, we shouldn't be offended every time, or we should be offended every time somebody doesn't believe like we believe, practice what we practice, stand for what we stand for. And so every time somebody says anything about Christianity, we all get our panties in a bunch. And we're offended. Man, when Christianity came into the world in the form of Christ, there was slaughter happening. Mary and Joseph didn't stand on the corner and point fingers at ever who was after them they obeyed the voice of God got on a donkey and got out of there come on somebody followed the voice went, went where God was telling them to go because they knew God had a plan for that child God had a plan and a purpose and, and we, we don't have time to, listen they didn't stand there wasting time protesting and demonstrating and, and doing all the other stuff that we want to do in the modern world that we live in. We are way too offended as Christian people. So they make fun of us. So what? Don't make me preach hard tonight. I don't have it. So they laugh at things we do. So what? So they don't believe everything that we believe. So what? When has it been about you having to have everybody on your side? It's not about that. Man, it's not about that at all. It's about me and you understanding that God's grace is great enough and big enough that He would come into the ugliness of our world and with all of its ugliness, He would still love it enough and not be afraid of it to plop right down in the middle of it and say, I have an answer for what's ailing you. I know that 
what happened at Christmas and in the aftermath of the embodiment of God in Christ. I understand that it's not just simply a peaceful, joyful, beautiful event to be celebrated once a year, but it's more than a generic hope for peace on earth and goodwill towards all men. And it's more than just a time for a temporary truce between fighting families and fighting churches. And that's not what it's about. You know what it is? Christmas is, and this, the aftermath of Christmas is God's personification in Christ of a challenge to every manifestation of fear, every manifestation of hatred, every manifestation for a desire for power and vengeance that want to run this world. I think sometimes when God hears all of our political rhetoric, He shakes His head and He says, My way. That's not my way. That's, not, that's, that's, that's how the kingdoms of this world get established. That's not how the kingdom of my God gets established. That's not how, that's not how this thing is going to turn around. That's not how... You got to get to the place to where instead of being offended and, and instead of wanting to fight back every time somebody says something negative about you or about your church or about your family or about what, you, you got to get to the place to where you say, peace, shalom. Because You get pulled into the fray. And when you get pulled into the fray, you get pulled into that aftermath, that bloody aftermath of Christmas. Am I making any sense? I feel like I'm walking in mud, but I'm, I'm trying to get there. What I'm trying to tell you is there's a better way. There's a better way. <laughs> and if you and I Stop telling the story with the visit of the wise men in Bethlehem. The only part we're left with is how all kinds of people united in responding with acceptance and joy and submission to Jesus. But that's only half the story. Because from the beginning of time, the world has always resisted the intrusion of Jesus. It's always resisted the intrusion of Jesus. I'm trying to make this personal. But what I'm trying to tell you is, God is wanting to, he's, yes, he's coming to this earth to establish a kingdom and an order of government on this earth. Yes, absolutely, 100%. But you know how he really wants to do that? Is he would, like, he would like to establish that kingdom and order of government in every heart. Because if he can establish it in your heart, you'll begin to live out what is in your heart. People ask the question all the time, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why do bad things happen in the world? You know, you know why all the hell and havoc is happening in this world? Because the kingdoms of the world are still ruling the hearts of men and not the kingdom of God. And people resist the rule of the kingdom of God. Because to resist the rule of the kingdom of God, like, like, if I accept the kingdom of God, it means I might not be able to slap you every time I want to slap you. How? It's a good thing. See, on your end, that's a good thing. Right? It, it means I might not be able to respond to everybody the way I want to respond to them all the time. It means sometimes, if I'm going to allow the kingdom to be built in my life, it means I might have to think before I speak. means I might have to be accountable for what I do, for what I say. And therefore, I walk more softly and more gingerly and gently because I understand that with everything I do, it carries weight. And I'm not just connected to one or two people. I'm connected to people everywhere. 
where. And so I, I have to understand that I'm not just out here on an island in the kingdom of God living and breathing in my life and coming to pass in my heart and in my life and in my mind. That's what he wants to bring to pass in the earth, but it has to start in my heart. It has to start right here in my heart. I read Hebrews to you, and I'm closing, but I, I read Hebrews to you. Because Jesus didn't get to stay in a manger. Jesus didn't get to continue sleeping peacefully and just live the rest of his life accepting gifts and praises. But the writer of Hebrews reminded us that Jesus as a true human being made in flesh in the middle of an ugly real world think about this think, think about this. just think about this I mean if you ever just like stop and think about stuff some of the stuff we're so sure we have an opinion about do you realize that Jesus started his life as a refugee He started his life on the run. You ever wonder why it is that Jesus has a heart for those who have no place? Come on, somebody. He started his life like that. He started his life running from people who were trying to destroy him. From the very beginning, darkness has been trying to take out that light that we know is Jesus. And from the very beginning, darkness has failed. Herod couldn't eliminate God's presence. Herod couldn't mess up God's plan to change how the world works. Herod, just like every other manifestation of hate, eventually dies. And the story continues after Herod is gone. Come on, somebody. <laughs> the journey of Jesus began with a midnight escape. First to Egypt, then to Nazareth. Think about it. Man, this is Jesus. First to Egypt, then to Nazareth. Then if you keep following his life, he winds up in a place called Galilee. And then he goes to a place called Jerusalem. Then he ends up at a place called the cross. And then he ends up in a place called the tomb. And the tomb becomes the second womb. And out of the second womb, that grave was birthed life for any and for all who would accept. And now then from there, the gospel of the kingdom has gone across the face of the earth. Come on. Herod couldn't stop it. No matter who's against Jesus in our world is not going to be able to stop it. You resisting him being king in your life is not going to stop it. Our story may end, but his story is going to continue to go on. No matter how ugly the world may be, the aftermath of Christmas is the story continues. Because he is greater than all of that. The aftermath of Christmas is that Jesus continued to grow. I know, I know, I know, I know. We, we're living in a, in a world that often sees God's kingdom of justice and mercy and peace as a threat rather than a blessing. We live in a world where today, 2016, people still massacre the innocent in order to push their political agendas. And we're living in a world that despite everything that's broken and warped and contrary to the way God wants it, don't ever forget this, in spite of it being broken and warped and contrary, Hal Brown, God still loves this world. You may not love it, 
But he still loves this world. He loves it so much that he is unwilling. Listen to this. <laughs> he loves this world so much that he's unwilling to reject it. And he's unwilling to leave it alone. And he was willing to drop down in the middle of it and become one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> he dropped right into Herod's backyard. And you know what that was? Him dropping right into Herod's backyard was God saying, take your best shot at resisting me. You can't stop what I've got planned. And listen, Jesus, let me, let me just say this to you. Jesus didn't come to earth and get to Gethsemane and be surprised that he was going to a cross. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. He knew when the Father sent him that he was coming on a mission to give his life. And yet he was willing to come under those conditions and go through opposition. And he was willing to go through suffering. And he was willing to go through even death so that we could have what God always intended for us to have. And that was life, real life, and life in a relationship with God. I am so sick of people trying to hold other people out of a relationship with God. You haven't died for anybody. Shut your mouth. You haven't done anything on that level. You let God be God and give every person an opportunity to know Him because that's why He came. And that's why he died. Well, they don't do what I want them to do, Larry. My dad is here tonight. He's the only one in my family brave enough to come. I appreciate that, Dad. That's high marks for you. Next gift you get is going to be good. But my dad gave me some advice when I started pastoring, he told me, son, people are like 900-pound gorillas. <laughs> What's the rest of it? Sleep where they want to sleep. They're going to eat what they want to eat, and they're going to go where they want to go. And the sooner you give up trying to control what everybody's doing and you just preach and love people, the better you're going to sleep at night. Listen, I didn't die for any of you. And if you're resisting, you're not resisting me. You're resisting the message of the kingdom. It's not me you have a fight with, it's God. Same person Herod had a fight with. The war is in your inner man. There's always been a war. There's always been a resistance. There's always been that. So does that cause you problems? It should. Because if we're serious about celebrating the birth of Jesus, then what we're doing is stepping right into the aftermath of Christmas. I don't know. Can you help me for just a minute? Yeah, you can. No, you can. I, will you? I know you. I know it's Christmas is over. But I told you I dug up some stuff. See, we only sing... I couldn't hardly get through Christmas Eve night because we sang Oh Holy Night and everybody knows the first verse, Oh Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. But you get into that second verse and truth shall he reign. Because the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Chains sh shall he break for the slave is our brother. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. Truly, he taught us to love one another. Man, I started singing that Saturday night and got all choked up. Because 
you don't ever hear that part of it. There's some real truth in those Christmas carols. And I got to putting this message together. I got to stumbling around. Then another Christmas song we sing, and Leland's playing it like only he can, but man, it's... goes just like this. I'm not trying to be a recording artist. I'm just wanting you to hear. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and sleepless dreams. The silent stars. Oh, man, that's so pretty, isn't it? I know I didn't get all the words right. But it's pretty, and that's what we sing. And that's, that's the song. That's the part we sing. But I got to thinking about the aftermath of Christmas and what the aftermath of Christmas means. It means that I've got to let the king come. He didn't stay a baby. He grew. He came here to become a king. And if I'm really going to allow the story to have the whole effect, i got to sing verse 3 of Old Little Town of Bethlehem. I didn't even know it had a verse 3. But verse 3 says, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Isn't that what we all pray? Oh, come, Jesus. Come on. Isn't that what we pray? Let's do that again. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend us we pray but the second stanza gripped my heart because I realized that to sing O Little Town of Bethlehem I have to align with the second stanza and the second stanza O Holy Child of Bethlehem descend to us we pray cast out our sin and enter in be born in us today. You know what you're praying? Do you realize what you're praying? What you're telling him is when you're inviting him in, you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of governing my own life. Yeah, come on. And I'm tired of going through all this resistance and pushing against you. I'm just tired of all of that. I'm tired of being Herod and being the king of my own life. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide with us. Our Lord, Emmanuel. I don't know if I've done very good tonight. No, 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 that's not what I'm asking. No, no. I'm wanting to give this to somebody. You can't let Jesus just stay a baby. We're praying for God to be embodied in us, to transform us into Christ's eyes and ears and hands and feet so that we can work in this world. And there are some of you sitting in here right now who want to use every excuse. You've been hurt in 2016, 2014, 2013, 2000. And I'm going to tell you what. If Jesus doesn't come get us, you're going to get hurt in 2017. Let me be a prophet. You're going to get hurt. You're using every excuse. Well, man, so-and-so's done this and said this about me. So-and-so did this. I don't like what the preacher did over here. I don't like what the preacher did over there. You're allowing all that stuff, all that junk, all that junk, and it's piling up in front of you, and it's junk, and you got
got to understand this, that God knows the pain that you've gone through. He knows the difficulties. He knows what it costs for you to be here right now. But the thing that grieves God more than anything else is you've gone through all that and you haven't claimed the things that he wanted you to claim while you were there. You went through all of it, but you didn't find him in any of it. And you've become bitter and resentful, and you're affecting everybody around you. You went through all of that and didn't hold on to God. Your story looks like Herod's story a bloody slaughter. When really, all you have to do is give up tonight and say, I want you to be the king of my life. And he'll gladly take rulership. I want you to stand with me. I know it's goofy, Leland, man. I know it. We shouldn't be singing, oh, little town of Bethlehem four days after Christmas. But I wonder, is there anybody in here tonight? I know we got to go. It's been a different Wednesday night. But for somebody here tonight, it could be the night that the baby begins to grow into the king in your life. Hallelujah.